pleasure to be back to Frupa Institute um, as a faculty fellow and to share with uh, everybody the reason we're here. Uh, so I, so my plan is to talk about one I would call urban system design using a use case in Tokyo, and I would uh, talk about what urban design means at the beginning and. At the end, I talk about an idea called urban tech. Uh, it's a kind of proposition or speculation uh, at the end. So this talk was delivered a month ago at Cambridge University, then the Gold Care Center for uh, Advanced Research Education in Singapore. So I uh, used some of material and reorganized them for the talk today, uh, mainly for Georgia Tech community. Uh, see if we can I uh, have an angle from GD perspective to look at these problems. And so I had three things to do. Uh, one is talk about urban design, which is what I do as an urban design pr practitioner, as a transformative approach. Then lead to the main use case, urban system design, how we utilize data, technology of some kind for system, systemic change. Uh, that's the, <clears throat> the, the main talk today. Then. In conclusion, I want to have some kind of proposition uh, for future city development to meet the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Many cities announced they want to do it. What is, what is the pathway for 2050 carbon neutrality? So that's my agenda today. So at the beginning, I want to share with you urban design. Um, that's something I do for years is for shaping public rent is a transformative approach that aim for enhancing people's quality of living. So this is a competition work I did in the city of Taipei, my hometown, so a transportation interchange. So we can see from this imagination of a public space that urban design offer idea or vision for vibrant places. As there's a three-dimensional circulation system, elevated walkway, uh, open space, uh, sunken plaza, linking to there's a metro station underground, and there's a surrounding future development we imagine. Okay, what would they be? Uh, office, housing, commercial, culture facility. So there's a typical urban design that I do uh, regularly. And urban design manage incremental change for long-term development, because there's an extensive spatial temporal environment. We have a vision to move forward to the future. And in that situation, we often see multiple stakeholder users, citizen, local government, uh, public private sector, they are involved in that process. But the professional play a role, uh, we call it master planner right, of some kind, uh, who often mediate between conflicting interest value among people. But in democratic society, it is very critical to achieve consensus from citizens in order to move forward such a complex project. And also, urban design also engage ecological hydrological landscape system for placemaking. So in this Watertown design competition that I did with my colleague, Ellen Balfour, who was a former dean of College of Architecture, and we, we got placed the, the third out of 81 submission. We didn't win. It's a kind of vernacular landscape. You can see the picture up uh, at the top. Uh, required some kind of revitalization strategy for its agricultural economy. So designer envisioned there's an injection of new modern lifestyle that is embedded by some kind of greenhouse technology somehow to enhance the product productivity of their agriculture uh, system. And in that project, urban design is also for enhancing ecological energy performance of city. So this profession, uh, I mean, architecture, city planning, urban design, over time, we have developed digital modeling tool to assess environmental consequences before the future development actually occur. But how do you evaluate alternative options? So in this design, we can see the design idea reorganize the settlement form of the village to promote energy performance at the top. And we reconstruct wetland system as a resilient 
green infrastructure to mitigate the risk of flooding, we, we model the flooding fluctuating situation and to pro provide a new transportation network uh, to enhance walkability and mobility. So these are the quick snapshot about urban design um, practice. So coming back to the school here in Georgia Tech, and we look back to see those contemporary practices from the profession. The current approach of urban design combined imaginary, provocative, somehow practical solution for local problem. However, they probably would be insufficient to addressing those prompting complex issues that we are facing, such as climate change. So earlier this year in February, uh, in the College of Design, we organized a panel discussion with panelists like Shubro sitting next to me, myself, uh, Professor Akito Muriyama from University of Tokyo, Dimitri Margaris from Aerospace Engineering, and Inga Rocker from Architecture. So we brought up some issues for discussion that like future city development will be becoming data-driven in the context of emerging technology, AI, data science, internet of things, urban automation. So what are the fundamental changes, impact of technology to city today, what is happening? And how will city design from our college? With technology, this institute has been broadly addressing that issue. How would that combination enable community to develop a more sustainable, resilient, socially inclusive urban future in the face of climate change? And we are not the, oh, the first to raise those questions. In 1990, when I was a graduate student, and there, I, I read a few important books like Information City, published by Manuel Castell from UC Berkeley. It was 1989. Uh, what does it mean, 1989? We know Yahoo started from 1994, where Google started from 1995. That was years before Yahoo and Google. And he talked about uh, how would the impact of new information technology to city community and places. It was amazing. And when we meet with the, the dean of school of architecture planning from MIT, he published City of Bits in 1994, the year, the year when Yahoo started. And when I was a student, I took his class. Uh, in 1999, he published Utopia. How would this new network system arrive with the new urban form architecture? It was such a fascinating um, discussion we had. And there are some discussion about, okay, what about societal problem? People talk about digital divide, right? The impact is the societal segregation because of this new technology. Okay, that was 1999. And 20 years later, what happened today? What is the question we should ask in 2020 when we look at internet of things, uh, there's Guang Tiang, physical environment, AI, data science, urban automation, how would they, again, influence city? And then how human perceive, use, and interact with the urban environment? So we came with a few questions. How would data science, for example, uh, we put out tons of data. They would open it to derive some kind of general principle or predictive model of some kind for local problems in city, which you have nobody contextual. Are we able to come with uh, those principles say from Boston and apply them to uh, New York, Washington, DC, and Atlanta is kind of problematic. So uh, when we look at those data and fascinating pattern, right, using high frequency data, we don't quite know how to use them for our urban planning problem, to be honest. So the second question would be, how would they, those data analytic technology enable good planning? We talk about good planning, right, for social equity sustainability, resilience, and so on. And I have another designer's question at the end, and how do we translate those ideas into the future urban form? What future city would look like? That's the kind of designer's question. And I might extend the time horizon a little bit longer. Would you like to ask? Yeah, I, I, I'm curious. When uh, you talked about these books that were published in the 90s, right? Yeah. I was curious, did they have particular hypotheses about how the future would be? 
and, and how um yeah 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 does today compare to there's no clear pictures but yeah i'm going to elaborate what's that i'm going to elaborate this is what you're going yeah, to elaborate yeah. <laughs> okay but the idea was fascinating yeah so let's look at a, a bit uh longer time horizon uh back to a century ago uh when the car was invented right model t right 1920 uh, that fundamentally changed the way we design city. City what didn't look like today, uh, before then. A modern city plan design model emerged, like you can see this model by architect Le Corbusier. All architects didn't learn from him from the day one. Uh, he laid out efficient road system to accommodate the new technology that's called, right? In 1950, 70, in this nation, we have observed a kind of overwhelming, enormous scale of infrastructure, the interstate highway system. So as a consequence, we have problem urban sprawl. We need quality growth, uh, like Catherine was here, um, and suburbanization. And we commute from far away to consume so much energy, you know, carbon emission and so on. And also keep on competing the car, right? That's the uh, that, that problem we are still trying to fix even today. And the, uh, the image of the third stage is probably where we are right now. We are emphasizing pedestrian friendly walking environment to encourage walking, biking, but not driving, driving too much to reduce transportation energy and carbon. And the final stage, like the right hand side is interesting. It's probably where we are moving over the next decade where EV, AV, electric vehicle, autonomous vehicle, and UAM, urban air mobility, uh, that will probably change the way we move, we live, work, and play. So what kind of a uh, new urban system will be needed to accommodate that radical change? So from here, I'd like to share with you uh, a seven years work that we have been doing uh, from 2000, probably 16. And 17, we bring that to our class. Uh, we call it Urban Design Studio. Over seven years uh, with our partner in Japan, University of Tokyo, Keio University, and some big developer like Mitsui, uh, one of the three biggest developers in Japan, and government uh, in Tokyo and central government in Japan, to look at those test beds. Uh, from 2017, we examined one of the main stadiums for 2020 to Tokyo Summer Olympic, moving to 2018-19, Kyojima, an inner city neighborhood for revitalization. 2020-21, we look into Shinagawa, one of the new maglev high-speed rail terminal and their waterfront. And from last year, we begin to look into Nihonbashi, a historical district of Japan. And from this year, we are moving to the new project in Tokyo Bay. We got a, they got a funding from central government for the next three years or so. And those are my key partners from Japan. And so that um, uh, Tokyo project has uh, kind of an amazing story. There was a historical intellectual legacy about Tokyo back to 1950-70. We call it urban metabolism. There was a group of architect, urban planner, policymaker that advocate future city that would need to adapt to the constant change for potential disaster like World War II, like the war, earthquake, hurricane occurring in Japan uh, from time to time. So, so that uh, kind of philosophy thinking was embedded in that movement. In the context of post-World War II, the reconstruction trend of Tokyo, when the population was growing rapidly. So the architect, Kenzo Tange, uh, he was a professor at University of Tokyo. He founded the Department of Urban Engineering. That was our partner in Japan. Uh, in 1970. And he proposed a plan for Tokyo Bay 1960 to envision a new city on top of Tokyo Bay Ocean to accommodate additional 5 million population in one decade. So you can see this kind of tree-like uh, urban structure over like, you know, how about it, 80, 80 kilometers, <laughs> kind of 50 miles, long axis on the bay. And it provides a flexible, framework for future function, like office, commercial, housing development. So 
the, this interesting proposal you, that was, although the Tokyo Bay wasn't built like this, but there was a great influence from this master plan. And we see an idea of a city like a metabolism, a complex system in which energy, water, human movement, economic activity operate simultaneously over a network system that was organized like a city as flow, the flows of all time. But unfortunately, the flow idea in that proposal, 1960, is about motorway. Hard driving, right? But keep in mind, 1960, the US, we were building our interstate highway system across the nation. So that was the, the background. And what about today? The city of flows are composed of information data and some of the near time decision making that penetrates through the entire urban system. So you can see the data, data visualization like GPS data that I can show you here, somehow represent pattern of how human movement flow over that network structure of the city. So in this collaboration, we pulled out like 2% of the daily GPS data to create kind of big data condition. And how do we process those data that are massive? And they are dynamic, very noisy, fragmented. They come with different formats. Uh, and sometimes in near real time, if we are lucky to get those data. So we need to find a way to capture data and then develop some kind of analytical technique to utilize those data for problems such as energy, water, mobility, to understand their total performance is almost impossible, uh, given that you can see this uh, huge structure accommodate 37 million population, the largest mega city in the world. So there was an ambition behind this idea. So in that book that we published 2020, we came with this uh, methodological urban system design kind of attempt to incorporate data analytics into urban design. So this idea of urban system design is not quite about drawing. You, know, you can make, make a plan, like deliver a drawing. It's more like a digital platform for decision making. You can see we have data of so many kinds, some are unstructured, some are structured, and you have a digital platform like GIS to accommodate information like topography, land use infrastructure uh, system, and you define your performance goal like key KPI, key performance indicator for problem. You have problem like heat wave, energy, carbon, flooding, uh, accessibility, and so on. So you need a lot of uh, toolbox, algorithm, modeling technique on performance, on human flow, and human experiences to put forward some information will be useful for decision making. And you need to bring them up to the community for discussion and interact with multiple stakeholders. We might have some kind of AI as an engine behind helping you process those data. So that is the methodology that we took into the, the first test case, uh, 2017, uh, in Misono, one of the main stadium for 2020 Summer Olympic. And this is an interesting story. And in that project, um, 2017, we, uh, we learned quite a lot. For example, how do they, so that's a few years before the game. So government wanted to do some kind of flagship, right? When the game opened, they can show the world the progress they are making. So that was the background. Okay, who knew what smart city meant 2016? Right? So it was kind of uh, a bit early. So at the beginning, the central government designated this particular area three square kilometers, about three something square mile, as a special energy zone. It's a regulation policy from central government. It's a special zone for uh uh, renewable energy. So that allowed the local government to deregulate zoning. Right? They can begin to relook how this area can be developed. And University of Tokyo was tasked to look at that problem. And they also demonstrate the same kind of public-private partnership to implement the idea. So they built up this UC, UDC me, uh, Urban Design Center of Misono, uh, uh, First five years, funding from central government, the local government. Uh, after five years, they need to find a way to sustain their own operations. And they build that center right there on the site. 
to coordinate projects. So at the beginning, uh, IBM came to them, and we sell you smart city monitoring system decision theater. They said no to IBM. They uh, are determined to capture their own data, develop their own application for their own problem. And they have a pressure. In five years, how do they build finance? Which means they need to develop a lot of a business model project to finance how they could continue running this uh, smart city ideas. And they built a neighborhood scale data center. It's a community level data center to capture local data for problem in community. And that's amazing. So there was a framework done by Keo University professor who lay out IoT infrastructure. It, it, I guess this is sort of where my question was going, but it, is this the same platform? If you go back two slides. Yeah. Um, that one right here was yeah. the framework for incorporating all the you know various structured and unstructured data. Is that platform built? And um, that the same platform that that's was... a platform that was published in the book later. Okay, but we would inspire and learn from those participants. One of them is this uh, IoT infrastructure, and they actually invest. Uh, some of those sensors, um, smart home, sidewalk, retention pond, mm -hmm. shopping center, mm -hmm. uh, to capture those data. And from devices, person to building, town center, to a problem of all kinds, right? energy problem, flooding problem, uh, safety. And there's one keyword, anonymization, right? That you need to reboot ID and so on. So that's the kind of framework they have been doing. So. So combination of locally ca captured data and some of the so-called big data uh, for problem. So that's the task given. One uh, issue is about mobility. So that uh, GPS data that upon the purchase from Docomo, like at and in Japan, the GPS data allow us to look into the community problem when you zoom in from that Tokyo metro area to a community. And those points that are moving are they working, biking, or driving, or taking public transit using machine learning to classify the transportation mode? And our students from Georgia Tech built uh, GIS. We were part of the process uh, for data from water flooding, network system, building, and zoning. And students show a model of traffic prediction. 5 p.m., 7 p.m., there will be traffic jam. And there was a traffic jam when we were there. That was very impressive. <laughs> where they did. And they also used, uh, with our partner, we used uh, supervised machine learning to classify those three GPS points. Are they working, biking, or driving? Or to interpret uh, some point, are they doing sightseeing, shopping, or job racing? Right? That's an interesting uh, idea. And from there, we also look into not only about human flow, human working movement. But also to begin to look at how human perceive the environment, how human sense experience city, in which city are dynamic setting and there's a temporal dimension. When you walk from point A to point B, what do you actually see in the city? So Georgia Tech students on the top, you can see them walking in the city uh, for an experiment by carrying um, those sensing devices for measuring data. Right, including environmental data, biological data, pulse, or uh, kind of physical data in the city. And we also apply the technique called pyramid seeing parsing network. There's a kind of technique now that students are using uh, to process image of the city or streetscape taken by assigning each pixel a category label to understand the view, how much green space, blue sky, building facade are you seeing when you walk uh, through a few hundred points uh, from point A to point B. And what is more important is that this exper experiential modeling is an interactive model. We turn data analytics to useful information for people, like when information is captured by individuals, mobile devices, how human would react, respond to those say, environmental information. Uh, that will be critical for climate resilient problem like heat wave attack, right? You need to know where is the cooling spot, where are you going to walk to? 
uh, so people can be informed in near re real time during the shock or disaster. And this is another example. We show the low income neighborhood uh, aging population flooding. The road network is so organic, narrow, because they build the city on top of farmland over time. And the government has been trying to widen the road because fire engine, the ambulance cannot drive it. And it was so hard because of the private ownership in, in Japan. So we tell the state district government, wait a minute, can we bring in other alternative solutions like e-talent, like Toyota, the autonomous vehicle, to drive in to help deliver logistic need for the community when there's a disaster. And those electric vehicles not in use, uh, they are underground in the park as an urban battery. But when there's a blackout, they become resilient infrastructure. So altogether, uh, data analytics through design would synthesize, synthesize a complex problem uh, of social, ecological, and technological system. So another example quickly is this impact of mobility. Uh, one project at uh, Shinagawa uh, is going to be turned to a new maglev, uh, high-speed rail terminal. This is Shinkansen. When you go to Japan, you take this uh, from Tokyo to Osaka. It's probably two hours, 20 minutes. But the new maglev would shorten the time to seven minutes. So it's called 70, 70, 70, the 70 minutes for a catchment of 70 million population. That's it. It's coming so that in 2030, because of COVID, it's a bit few years delay. Uh, that system, system will be running. So, Shinagawa will become a new gateway to Tokyo Island in the central uh, Tokyo station. So, our students with our partner deliver a Shinagawa master plan urban design to look at how this new gateway uh, and their future possibility. Only 14 minutes to Haneda Airport. So, there are lots of things are happening in this uh, particular area. And one group of our students, they, use, uh, they look at the impact of the new station that will bring in more population, more visitors to the area. What will be the future mobility? They use face, agent based modeling, uh, look at the behavioral logic, like who are commuting or work, working as a resident, and when do they move uh, to where? And what kind of transportation mode? they take in Shinagawa using some data like personal trip survey. So that's the kind of uh, this work students do. Uh, the combination of urban design, uh, plan making process, and this kind of data analytics modeling uh, work. So our work was featured by uh, Esri, a company, uh, one of the leader in the leader in GIS industry. Uh, they say Tokyo reimagined the world's largest city and advanced analytics. The Georgia Tech interdisciplinary program teach students principal urban design and give them tools to apply smart solution for Tokyo's future growth. I'm not sure are we that good <laughs> <laughs> for doing that. Uh, there was the and so other than that, we also look into uh, new mobility like urban air mobility uh, that is coming. Believe me, uh, we visit uh, one of flying car laboratories in Japan. Uh, they are testing the car. The car is quite ready. It's the urban infrastructure that is not ready. So how do we redesign a vertical for landing flying car? It's an interesting test. It took, it's an intersection between urban ground mobility and urban air mobility. And how do you kind of develop this uh, system called vertical design? So there was an imagination from our students. So that is coming. Uh, 2018, Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, Industry has partnered with Ministry of Land Infrastructure to develop the roadmap for air mobility revolution, the world's maybe the first effort. And that reminds me uh, a book long time ago called The View from the Road, uh, 1970, published by Donald Apoya, professor from UC Berkeley and Kevin Lynch from MIT. 19, so that was 1970 when U.S. has interstate highway system. So what is the view from the road? That's a, that's a total innovative idea, new experience, new horizon when we drive on the five highway. So they got funded from, uh, I think, federal government uh, to look at this problem. 
So in UC Berkeley, they built physical model like San Francisco downtown and use micro camera to simulate what you actually see when you drive along the street. That was 1970. The view from the road. What about the view from the air? Right? The, the coming decade. That will give you a whole new vision about how we shape our urban uh, future. So the final project uh, is this urban carbon mapping coming back to this carbon neutrality objective. Uh, our partner in Japan led this tool to do urban carbon mapping, combination of transportation and building energy. But there's so much carbon emission happening right now, right, hourly, daily, annually. So maybe the more important question would be what would be that mitigation reduction strategy through design and new development? So we came in. Uh, from urban design and system thinking perspective. So the one final project we did was in Nihonbashi, uh, the central historical district in Japan. So there's a uh, highway on top of the river called Nihonbashi River. That was built in 1960 when Tokyo organized Olympic 1960. There was an expressway being built, but today they like to remove it uh, to daylighting the river. And that gave them opportunity of revitalizing the district called uh, Nihon district. So there was a background. And that project was sponsored by Mitsui, one of the biggest developers in Japan. So our students put out big data, like a high frequency data, to do the activity mapping, um, like what's happening in the city. But at the same time, we put out small data. The traditional data like zoning, uh, flow area, the density of population of the city. And we like to find out how would those ongoing activity inform this zoning regulation. Uh, that's something we are trying to do. Do we uh, ask people to move? <laughs> <We're like, laughs> <we're like, laughs> yeah. yeah. You keep going. All right. So, <laughs> okay. So, so that uh, is a kind of uh, idea to look at how data will be useful. Uh, for like a local problem like planning. The other example is still then uh, look at the current development model in Japan. We're doing one our sponsor. They tend to build this kind of high rise, mixed use development, very slick, beautiful, uh, kind of high quality development in Japan. And they build develop so much uh, with so much energy consumption. So the team from Jojo Tech and New Tokyo we come with an alternative solution. We let them build more, so paying back financially. They can also reduce carbon energy by almost fifty percent. So, which means they are better way of designing, revitalizing your development to be better in performance. And our students also look into the small size neighborhood over to two thousand fifty. Uh, incrementally, how would the revitalization they can go in parallel with the carbon reduction? So that they get into the energy performance of those building 159 building that would uh, become denser for paying back financially for redevelopment at the same time to reduce energy and carbon. Uh, so that's the strategy they put forward. And still, they also develop a dashboard kind of digital platform for showing how much are you building, uh, how much job, how many jobs are you bringing to the community, uh, energy demand and carbon emission. And to compare different alternative scenario by high uh, human scale, by reducing the density, how much performance you will get. For high density scenario, uh, like uh, energy demand per capita tend to be lower when you have high density technology or other typology. So that's kind of a, a work we do. We did for the stakeholder. So this slide is to show how all of, how those components are articulated uh, as a model to integrate community engagement in Japan. Uh, they have a kind of a community participation tradition. You need to engage user, citizen, and stakeholder and come with alternative solution and which solution will perform better in energy mobility carbon, you need to do some kind of evaluation of performance and to go green. 
right? So one of the reasons they like to go green, like leave a neighborhood, is for money, right? Where would the money come from? Uh, as if government does not have enough funding, they may go for private sector like green bond from uh, Mitsubishi Finance, right? They offer the green bond, $500 million for green project. And you need to show it is a green project by showing that you get platinum, league and the, and to, so there's an articulation of the process and kind of consensus making to finance your project. And this is the next year we are moving to the new project uh, to the Tokyo Bay, right? So that's the, the stepping part for the future city. And there was a background that governor of Tokyo announced that zero emission by 2015. And there's a future Tokyo ESG strategy uh, environment, ecology, economy, and also the S means Shibu Sawa and G means go to one of the pioneer of their modern development like ESG. So she announced that vision uh, as is a background for this next studio. Okay, I'd like to move to the concluding remark. And that was uh, again the MIT Technology Review uh, talking about how mega city would lead the first the fight against climate change. Like we we know like 2050, so much billion population will be in city. And among those world 100 most popular city, I think they are mostly responsible for one fifth of global carbon emission. That was uh, the, the data from this article. So Tokyo demonstrate one of this model uh, that would uh, develop a pathway to carbon neutrality. So what I've left and learned from the use case in Tokyo is an attempt to develop a pathway moving toward that carbon neutrality by 2050 and climate resilience. So this uh, methodology uh, is suggests an, a possible approach to incorporating data analytics and technology into the design decision for problem, for actual problem in community. But what remained unclear to me was how do we translate those ideas into the future urban form? What the city would look like right, for the next day. That's something I'm very fascinated about as a designer. And also what social institutional financial process should be needed to implement that ideas, the system thinking in urban design, in which data science and technology are enablers for sustainability, carbon neutrality, and climate change. I think that remains uh, unclear. And so looking back to our city here, what is happening in North American city? How much were those ideas or similar model developed over here? So 2015, Google launched Cyber Lab. Everybody, many of us heard about that as an urban innovation for solving urban problems. So the director, then Dr. Rowe, uh, he was a former deputy mayor of uh, New York City under Bloomberg. He was commissioned to develop Keyside area of Toronto waterfront. And he made a famous remark. What would a city look like if you started from scratch in the internet era? Or to build a city from the internet out, right? So that's an ambitious uh, statement he made. And a few years later, not many years, 2020, the beginning of the COVID, Google announced the sidewalk lab. Uh, to abandon this project abruptly and say, okay, because of COVID, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but many people believe that it's mostly because of the growing fear of losing privacy right? uh, in a smart city. Who in the world would like to live in a city where you will be sensed and monitored <laughs> by those pervasively uh, overwhelming camera and sensor? And what also went wrong was the project's public engagement. Uh, I think the resistance from the community, right, showed there's a, it's grounded, there's a grounded bottom of democracy for decision making that is so important. And I read it with my student. We used, we read their master plan, thousand pages, <laughs> uh, published by San Toronto. Uh, and we look at the master plan report. So it's very ambitious. They show the kind of enthusiasm about how new technology become driver 
for development, and cities are living laboratory for innovation. But without social consensus or institutional mechanism of some kind, based on democratic process, those ideas remain on paper. Right. And recently, this uh, article by MIT Technology Review showed that Toronto wants to kill the smart city forever. And you look closely, that proposal uh, is there's no tech, only tree. They only plant tree and tree in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so sad. I was wondering, um, do you really think that by planting tree in the city we, would resolve many problems? Uh, that we are facing, right? So that's uh, kind of dilemma. And Jennifer Clark, our, one of our former colleagues in Georgia Tech, who is now uh, a faculty in uh, Arizona State, Arizona Rona State. Ohio State. Oh, Ohio State. Ohio State. Okay, Ohio, sorry, State. Sorry, I'm, okay, Ohio State. And he thought, she followed up that debate uh, in her 2021 article at MIT Technology Review. And she argued that city is not customer. Um, and to more precise, cities should not be the customer when most tech com company, uh, they mainly see uh, like city are places where the customer live, right? And urban planner, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, haven't been driving the smart city trend, and it has been driven by tech sector, uh, which has very different norm and goal. And so they're Test bed experimentation are uh, common in the company, but they're sometimes uncomfortable for city and community. So Jennifer say, okay, virtually all of those projects have failed to adapt technology solution to the need of individual city and region. And what do we do? And maybe we should find a way uh, to look at how technology-driven development would serve the public good city at the same time. And the other uh, book I want to mention at the end is Shannon Mattern, a professor at UPenn. And she developed a series of insights from the new book called City is Not a Computer or Other Urban Intelligence. And that is an amazing book. Um, like the uh, search for become a metaphor, inspiration of city making. And I think the book title was inspired by this idea called City is Not a Tree, Christopher Alexander. Uh, and that, um, of course, we know that city is not a tree today. City is not a computer. City shouldn't be a machine. Like a, we shouldn't design city like an energy efficient machine, right? Although we are interested in energy performance. And city is probably closer to organism, like that machine. Uh, or as a complex ecosystem. I think Professor Mark Weisler would like to make another talk. He would elaborate that idea. So Shannon um, um, Matten, uh, she offers some kind of criticism on the idea that cities shouldn't be computable system. And the idea of system thinking for urban design, derived from the proposition that city is a complex system of system, it is like a constellation of millions and millions of computers. And urban scientists, like Shubro is leading a program right now, uh, our new MSCY program, model city as an informational logistic system. system. City planning is seen as a science of communication, information, and control in which information flow penetrates through the entire urban infrastructure system. And in the not very far distant future, our future urban life will be all programmable, right? That's scary. And to a certain extent, predictable by the algorithm. So Shannon offered that criticism uh, and she concluded we need new model for thinking about cities that do not compute. Well, why I find her article remarkably beautiful. This is really a beautiful uh, article and book and crystal clear by her articulation of those arguments through historical evidence, intellectual insight. But her conclusion is a bit disappointing. <laughs> she, would, she would run away and go to those corners of cities that do not compute. <laughs> <laughs> and without offering any approach about how we engage and shape 
our future world in a much more progressive way. So perhaps that is a, that is a job of the urban architect, urban designer, urban scientist, and engineer for people like us in Georgia Tech. Right? We should develop some kind of uh, um, you know, alternative approach for this problem. The final slide. So then I speculate, maybe we can, this idea called urban tech, a model of data and tech-driven city development based in climate change. And we all know that cities should lead a fight for climate change. There's an overwhelming statement about urbanizing world and the goal of zero emission and so on. And urban tech as a model is to design systemic change. Right? How would increasing AI, IoT, emerging technology to become enabler for enhancing community sustainability, resilience, social equity. And that leads to the, the one of very critical question on digital privacy and control. About who own the data, who control the data, what mechanism of data application can be developed for problem needed in community and city. And it's so important. And then how do we democratize the process of data-driven decision and technology application for community and place making? So that was my final question. And the final remark would be, uh, we're in this nation could offer the great potential and capacity to offer such a model. So maybe urban tech at Georgia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> is the way to go. All right, that's all I have for today. Are there any questions? And, uh, and, and we'll also open it up to the uh, uh, people online. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll take questions in the room first and then we'll go to online. And when that time comes, if you just want to unmute and, and unmute your video as well, ask, ask away. Any questions in? A question, but a comment. You certainly cover the universe. <laughs> it's what I would offer relative to systems. And particularly, it's interesting to me that all of it revolves around mobility systems a great deal of it. And I think about drones. We don't have an infrastructure to land drones now. Yeah. yeah. So when we talk about urban air mobility, we are, in terms of implementation, very, very, very far away. So I think that this, the, the value is that there's a lot of very good APDs, uh, which are perhaps promising. Um, but the difference between ideas, implementation, where we are and where we need to go are vast goals. And we probably need to segment it and think about it in that way to begin to make some progress in those four uh, directions. Uh, and I think some of what you've already today certainly shines the light in that regard. Yeah. Uh, I like your commentary, Catherine. Um, I don't think there's a universal methodology for this, and because urban problem has been contextual, yeah. that it is defined by uh, community. Urban air mobility, mobility, for example, right, uh, is a one specific problem we can address in Atlanta. Uh, traffic jam, maybe Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta Airport is a huge parking outside of the domestic terminal. Huge. The size of that parking is like. Midtown Manhattan. <laughs> How do we repurpose those parking for a new city development adjacent to airport like Amsterdam, Schiphol, right? And also using that new mobility system to help. I think that is very specific, very contextually defined. So we maybe develop use case one after the other. Um, I think um, from the talk, I understood that one of the biggest resistances to smart cities is the privacy issue that yeah. people feel. But if we're anonymizing the data and we're helping governments make decisions, because governments are already making decisions for mm -hmm. the livelihood of people, why can't they use data to help inform those decisions and improve policy? Why are people resisting smart cities so much. Yeah, as I, I think privacy <laughs> is the greatest fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talk about trust, right? Can we develop a way of processing data with trust using blockchain? Some of those are beyond my domain knowledge. I know our computing school they are looking out 
security safety of data. When you remove the ID, uh, you it somehow constrain the data quality you do. So there's a, some alternative way to look at those issues, right? Can we still? Well, I think if we are already being surveilled, there's yeah. already a lot of uh, data that is being collected. It's only when you have these data breaches, then that's when people suddenly become aware, oh my God, you know, that's all this data. But uh, the train has left the station. So, you know, yeah. we are going to make it secure. You have to make it more secure. But whether there will be more data being collected of individuals or not, that question, I think, has already been answered. There will be data. Yeah. The question is who collects it and who has authority over it and yeah. how it's secured. Those are the questions that yeah. are now the bigger questions. Yeah. But whether there is data about us and mm -hmm. about our enormous amounts of data that's been collected by different entities. Yeah. It's not been aggregated in a way that uh, you can make those connections, which uh, yeah. is probably both up. You know, in some ways a benefit, and the other ways it's yeah. a disbenefit because you could do much more if you were able to. Yeah. But uh, the surveillance is already happening. So outside of that yeah. big issue, uh, the example, one of the examples in Tokyo, uh, Misono data center is a neighborhood scale data center. Some data can be only be captured locally, so like keep it for community's purpose. And I find that example fascinating. It's a way to dem democratize the way people own the data, utilize the data for their problem. And because Google, um, Facebook, they won't be interested in your flooding problem, right? <laughs> if they are not, a, not for their uh, kind of a commercial interest, that, that it might be a, a, a good model. You may have come to this in the beginning of your presentation. I was curious about, are there any other uh, examples of cities? Like I'm familiar with some though, but are there any other democratically led uh, governmental institutions or whatever that's a template that you're paying attention to? Oh my God, I can't look at what they're doing. Because I know in South Korea, not only do they have some though, but Honda is taking a really strong interest in urban air mobility. They're investing, yeah. you know, you know in, in the least as well. Yeah. So like, how are you looking at that? And, and uh, why do you think that perhaps some of those democratically led uh, initiatives don't seem to be as helpful as, in, let's say, hypothetically in, in China? We've only heard from about it and saw a few papers, yeah. but it seems like the Chinese are really onto it and uh, they make the investments and it's not mm -hmm. so much of an economic incentive. Yeah. But I remember you covered it a little bit, you mentioned the financial yeah. aspect of, yeah. Yeah. of uh, implementing. Yeah. So, so that, um, <clears throat> the, I'm particularly interested in some city in East Asia, as Songdo in Seoul, Korea, um, Tokyo in Japan, Singapore, Taipei. I think they are experimenting a lot of these ideas is happening right now. So we like to be part of the process. That's why I said it's a new proposal to BDISS. But what about we come with this kind of international exchange to allow students from Georgia Tech and faculty to be connected to so that part of the world when we shut down Sidewalk Toronto, right? And something, some other thing is happening. And we'd like to see how we can learn from different models. Yeah. All the questions so I'm curious, what is the ideal democratized process of the adjourned decision? Um, since I've heard a lot of like democratizing, the importance of democratizing the data and democratizing uh, the data-driven uh, decision-making, but they usually end up in a dashboard and a public URL, but it always ends there. So I'm curious, like, what does it really mean to democratize the process of this 
data driven. Yeah. Um, yeah, simple example. Uh, in the city of Taipei, I was the advisor to the mayor for two years uh, before that mayor stepped down. Um, I think I was part of a process of building urban data center in Taipei. They get Microsoft to help them. But it's a citywide data center. It's so hard. <laughs> you know, 20 to 25 division department. It's so all kind of data that are fragmented. They like to build a data center. And that uh, is a kind of attempt of many cities. Like Singapore is building virtual Singapore uh, database, but they control their own data. They are not much open to the public. Uh, but Taipei is more open uh, compared with Singapore. And but the Japan example, like Misono in Tokyo, is a community neighborhood level data center, right? Where you have more direct interaction about what problem you are facing. And I find there are several models emerging. So I don't know which one would somehow succeed in the end. There is also the example from New York City mm. and uh, the the chief uh, information officer used to be Al Mashariki, who came here and he's been you know, talking to us. And some of the examples he presented were amazing. You know, they collect a lot of data and they make it publicly available. You can go to their website. And they have maybe five, six hundred different uh, kinds of data that they collect on building energy or transportation. So what they do is they actually incentivize high schools, um, <clears throat> universities to come up with ideas about how to use the data. And then they allow startups to use the data to uh, develop new kinds of apps that uh, communities can use for their own purposes. So they incentivize people to use the data in a way that benefits the community. Yep. Yeah, I had a question. I have to admit, I am kind of worried that trees and those kind of like ecosystems are not part of this uh, urban design. If you are familiar with some cities in Europe, uh, there is no problem over there because they are able to hold to their all the traditions. But if you adopt this kind of a model to developing countries, I'm curious how can you still hold your goals with uh, equity and all these other kind of problems with the minorities that are facing already a lot of concrete in the cities. And just if they start prioritizing only looking at uh, how uh, people are mobilizing and building more roads and you know making more houses in the cities so that mm -hmm. Uh, it's uh, it's more viable, but then the cities are not anymore livable. I never enjoyed this living in a city without trees, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So how can you transfer this kind of a model to a developing country? Yeah, uh, because my only give me forty minutes, so I do cover the landscape <laughs> ecology. <laughs> I have a, a course called Urban Ecological Design, talk about tree. Okay. <laughs> uh, and one example was uh, forestry informatics. I designed Taipei Botanic Garden mm -hmm. um, a few years ago uh, using the idea uh, the sensor captured data from the plants mm -hmm. in the Botanic Garden by uh, humidity and, and a lot of uh, the, the plant growth. And those data were turned to visualization or some kind, like in the evening, turned to different color. And as a predictive model, say, okay, tomorrow it's going to rain, the garden will be turned to purple. Or like, uh, so that is a, like the, the urban public space might become biological sensor. It's a public space, per se. So that natural dimension is so yeah. incredibly okay. important. Are, are there any questions online, real quick? Um, I know we're over time, but. All right, well, I, I'd like to take executive privilege and ask one last question. <laughs> so, uh, um, particularly your studies of East Asia, um, where population is declining. Um, is there anything that uh, smart tech cities could help to inform how 
a city can contract so we don't end up like Detroit? How can Tokyo shrink mm -hmm. to, I don't know if Tokyo is shrinking, but Japan overall is shrinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so presume, you know, Detroit went from a population of mm -hmm. 2 million to 1 million. Yeah. Yeah. And it devastated that city. Yeah. So how can particularly East Asian cities where population is decreeing South Korea, yeah. Japan, mm -hmm. maybe Taiwan. Yeah. And, and aging as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do not have an answer for this question, uh, but uh, Tokyo is not shrinking. Tokyo will continue to be the largest city in the world by 2030. But 2050, there will be other Africans, African cities, Southeast Asian city, etc. right? So that part of the world normally broadly are shrinking, as you say. And I can observe some new pattern emerging, but not quite clear what that pattern would be. People begin to move out to of the central Tokyo to very urban area because of uh, remote working become possible, right? And that area, the housing price lower, more green, allow them to have better living quality. It was impossible for Japan because you know Tokyo is is such a centrality. A lot of people there. Lifelong career is to go to central Tokyo to work and have a dream in Ginza right, and go back home. So there's a kind of mentality that you need to go to the center to be meaningful in your life. Right? That's Japan. But now there's a movement that people begin to move out. It's new. right? So what would that happen? Uh, that maybe we can develop a new pattern, combination of nature, agriculture, urban life with a kind of a new information system to support uh, the workplace. They might be the future. I don't know. Suburbs <laughs> are the future is what you're saying. Uh, maybe Atlanta <laughs> has a chance, right? <laughs> Since we are so, so sprouting already, maybe we can develop some kind of polycentry community mm -hmm. neighborhood that can yeah. sustain by itself. Well, thank oh, you very much.